Wow. What a stark difference. Isn't that amazing to even see that this man is currently supposedly running the country? Uh, we, we, we mentioned that. We, I mean, it's like elder abuse. You know, we, we literally feel bad for him, even though we don't agree with pretty much anything he stands for. And I certainly am not a fan of Joe Biden. And when he was in his heyday, didn't agree with pretty much anything. But the thing is, when you see this, you know, our heart as a believer, as a Christian, we feel bad to see literally this man in the state that he's in. I have a father who has dementia and it's a very debilitating, very sad disease to watch happen. And we're believing that the Lord is working on healing him right now. But, you know, even when you watch my father, I think my father could do a better job than Joe Biden in running the country. It's unbelievable to see what's happening with Joe Biden. It's unbelievable to see that this man is running the United States of America. He is considered the leader of the free world. And what we've been talking about is they've been hiding this fact. We've known this. We've seen this. We've understood that this was the situation. I mean, most of us that watch this broadcast, we knew a year ago that Joe Biden was deteriorating. We knew that he didn't have his faculties, that he wasn't coherent, that he wasn't able to speak, that he read a teleprompter. And even when he did that, he could barely even read correctly. And it's amazing how the leftist media have tried to portray Donald Trump as somebody who's deteriorating. When we watch Donald Trump getting off that stage, here's a man that fully is in control, understands exactly where he is, uh, spoke very quickly at the debate. He, he had wit. He, he spoke precisely. He explained his policies in a very uh, elaborate way. And then you have Joe Biden, which uh, probably I don't think even the worst possible scenario would we imagine it would have gone as bad as it did. And so the Democrats have been in panic mode ever since. And the talking heads all across the media and the social media and donors, everybody is now saying, Joe Biden, you need to drop out. And I actually shared a word on my Facebook page this week, and I put it up on remnant.news, which is our blog site, um, how I believe that the Lord sent me a prophetic warning to pray against one of the potential people who I think that they could do a bait and switch with right before the Democrat convention. Now, uh, Mario wrote an article on this as well on his blog, which is on mariomurillo.org. And I would highly suggest you check out his blog as well, uh, because we, we all feel, and I think we're pretty sure about this, that they're going to switch out Joe Biden. So the question then is, who are they going to switch Joe Biden out with? And then we have to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail. Is this something that's been planned? Have they been planning this all along? Have they been, uh, do they have a secret October surprise or, you know, something that they have up their sleeve that they're going to bring in this person? And when they're in the honeymoon phase and the Democrat base and those on the left are so excited about this new candidate, maybe Gavin Newsom, maybe Michelle Obama, okay? Then before the right has a chance to vet this person, before the media, which, you know, we know the media doesn't really vet the Democrat candidate like they do the Republican candidate anyways, because the media is uh, 90% owned by six corporations and those corporations have to be, uh, you know, in lockstep with the other propaganda that's being pushed on Americans from the leftists and the radicals and the, the globalists. So anyway, here we are, Joe Biden going to be replaced. And I believe the Lord is saying for prayer warriors around the world to pray against them putting in a Jezebel spirit into the White House, somebody that we all know could potentially be very evil and very uh, disruptive, even worse than Joe Biden, that her husband has probably been secretly running the Biden administration, hint, hint. And if they put her in, uh, we know that it would be probably the most radical version of the Democrats. And so I, I would just ask that you would join me in praying against this because I believe the Lord gave me a prophetic warning to say we need to pray against this. I'm not saying it's for sure. I'm not saying that's who the Democrats are going to put in. I'm not saying that God said that to me, that that's for sure what's going to happen. But I feel an unction in my spirit that we need to be praying against this person because we know that this family, if you think back to the last administration before Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, what was it, uh, 40, 44, you know, think about when a lot of this stuff that we're currently dealing with, a lot of the persecution light that I call it against uh, religious liberties and freedoms and a lot of the censorship upticked, we saw a lot of the globalist policies. I mean, I think of things like the Paris Climate Accord and just a lot of the direction in which uh, the world is now moving under this administration, which is really a third term of the Obama administration. So 
uh, prayer warriors, will you pray? Will you pray that uh, this particular person is not put in to this position? And will you pray against the, any wicked plans of the enemy? Because right now, this Kairos moment in time, this time that we're at, as America is at a pivotal crossroads, I still don't feel, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't feel that a lot of the church understands the urgency of this moment. Do you, how do you feel about that? Put it in the comments below. Do, does your church get it? Does your pastor get it? And I'm not here to bash anybody, but this is just something that I've noticed as we go around the country and we see a lot of what's going on. It just seems to me like a lot of pastors are not really astute and understanding the significance of this moment that we're in right now. And so there's a remnant, thank God, that's rising up. And there's going to be some good news that we report on in just a few minutes. Uh, but I think I have a, a second clip that I want to play right now. Let's go ahead and play that second clip. Here in North Carolina and across America, who are working hard to find a secure place in the middle class. The moms who worry that they're... I saw in him then the same character that I see in him today. And even though he has faced unimaginable tragedies, his optimism is undone. Joe, you did such a great job. You answered every question. You knew all the facts. And let me ask the crowd, what did Trump do? It's, it's almost unbelievable. Sometimes I'm almost speechless when I see some of these things and I think, my goodness, I mean, I remember, you know, Ronald Reagan, the most eloquent communicator, you know, as president in the 80s. And I think, how do we go from Reagan to Joe Biden? Joe Biden, I, I'm not trying to be mean here, but you remember that movie Weekend at Bernie's? Sometimes I almost feel like that that's the reality. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. It's almost like we're living in Weekend at Bernie's. I mean, you have Joe Biden who's out there speaking to her husband as if almost like he's a child and you have him this face this this look that he has on his face i mean he seems like he's totally confused totally disoriented and uh, we've talked about in previous broadcasts how we believe part of this is the judgment that's come upon america but i believe that we're still in this pivotal moment of time where we could see america turn a corner and we're going to build that case as we go on in the show but you know, just looking at Joe Biden, uh, it's unbelievable. You know why Democrat donors are concerned and they're trying to put as much pressure as they can on the Biden family. And it appears to be that there's some type of struggle going on where the Bidens are not wanting to pull out and the Democrat base and, and the leadership of the Democrat Party and uh, those that, you know, the donor class are wanting him to pull out so they can make the switcheroo. But the question is, is this all part of a plan? I would probably say it is. It's probably a big show that we're watching. And uh, I would be willing to say that I think by the time the Democrat convention happens that we're going to see one of these other potential uh, shadow type, uh, you know, uh, Gavin Newsom has been running a shadow campaign. And a lot of people think that he's going to be the guy that they put in there. But here's why I would say that I'm not sure about that. And, and I know that he is a darling of the left, and I know that a lot of people in the Democrat Party like Governor Newsom. But you got to remember, Governor Newsom has to run against his own record. And if you look at the state of California, they are in uh, much distress right now. You have lots of people moving out of California in the droves, going to red states, states like Texas, states like Tennessee. Uh, half of my church is what we call California refugees, people that have left the state of California because the cost of living is so high, because the taxes are so high. Uh, you know, they, they're just not even able to live there anymore and have a comfortable life. I mean, everything is so expensive. Rents are expensive. Housing costs expensive. Gas prices are expensive. And a lot of these sanctuary cities have also brought in a lot of migrants and uh, so it's just a mess all, all around. It's a mess. Homelessness out of control. Uh, we showed a few weeks ago about Union Square up in San Francisco, which used to be a beautiful 
city. I mean, just a gorgeous city. I remember when I was a kid. Do you remember how beautiful San Francisco was? Now you go there. My wife doesn't even want to get out of the car when we go there. She, she doesn't even want to go there. Uh, you know, it's that, it's that bad. I mean, you drive down the streets of San Francisco and you have people openly doing drugs right there on the street. You got homelessness out of control, people defecating on the sidewalk. Unbelievable. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, California is done. I, I believe that God is still moving in California. We're seeing movements in California uh, of, of on-fire preachers that are speaking on, on Hollywood Boulevard. They're speaking at, at the beaches, and people are getting baptized up and down the state. Uh, I know we're going to be going out there with a tent meeting pretty soon in Tulare, California, and Mario's going to have a tent crusade up there. So stay tuned for that. We believe that God's not done with California. But the leadership of Gavin Newsom has been absolutely tragic, has been unbelievable to watch what he's done with California. I, I can't see how anybody would think that there's wins there, uh, even the Democrat Party. So, you know, in my head and what I'm thinking is that they're going to pull somebody out that is the least likely person that, that no one would have thought of. Of course, we're thinking of it. But I still I have this feeling about Michelle Obama. And so we just really need to be praying against this, friends. And I'm not saying that if she doesn't get in there that we still don't need to be praying. But I just I just feel like they have a plan here. And I put a word out about this for intercessors to be praying. And many, many people have written me about this and said that it bore witness in their spirit. So uh, that's what's going on in the situation with the debate. Uh, since it's happened, uh, many Democrats calling for uh, Joe Biden to step out. It certainly looks like there's going to be a switch happening in the next couple of weeks leading into the Democrat convention. We're going to have to continue to follow this story. But in the meantime, let's pray fervently for America. Let's continue to pray for favor and that the Lord would continue to rise up people in this hour that are on fire for him, that are spreading the good news of Jesus, that are getting people saved and set free and healed and delivered all around the nation in Jesus name. All right, let's go on to the next segment. We've got a video from our friend Jonathan Kahn, and he is uh, reporting on a story that actually him and I were emailing back and forth when this first happened. And I said, Jonathan, I think you need to say something about this. And he agreed. And he actually did an amazing video on it. But let's go ahead and play this clip from Jonathan Kahn. The All right. Now, I know there's going to be people in the comments that are going to say, that's for a show. It's for a show called House of Dragons. Yes, we understand that. I understand that. But there's a significance. We know in the book of Revelation, the Bible calls Satan the dragon. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, in America's biggest city, if you think about uh, America, and Jonathan Kahn's done a great job in the past in the Harbinger and other books that he's written explaining uh, some of these Harbingers in New York City and in other places around the country. But to me, this is very significant. Why would they put a dragon on all of these buildings? and on the New York Stock Exchange. And it literally says, the sign under these dragons says, you must choose. What? What do you mean you must choose? So I understand it's a television show or a movie or something along those lines. I don't watch it, so I don't really know anything about it. But to me, this had prophetic significance because the fact that they have these dragons all around the city, and by the way, this is considered the year of the dragon. So uh, very interesting when we're seeing all these things coming new ahead around the world, when you look at what's happening in Eastern Europe, when you look what's happening in Israel right now, when you look what's happening with the, we just talked about how the Saudis are not renewing their contract with the dollar and that they're now, uh, you know, selling oil outside of the U.S. dollar and the global reserve status is now, uh, you know, in, in peril. I mean, we don't even know what's going to happen the next few years with the U.S. dollar. And I don't think it's something that's going to happen right away, but it certainly could. And many economists are sounding the alarm about this, that the whole Brenton Woods deal is now basically being unraveled because of the rise of the BRICS. So there's so many different things that are happening on the world stage. And then here in America, of course, we're in a very important election year. And we see the spiritual battle playing out before our eyes right now, light versus darkness. I mean, whether you look at the curriculums with our kids and you got some transvestite that's trying to read to kids at libraries and in schools, and all these places. I mean, it's such a battle of light versus darkness. It's not, I'm not talking about political matters. These are spiritual matters. And then you have America's biggest, most populous city with dragons on the Empire State Building, which by the way, used to be one of the tallest buildings and it still is one of the tallest buildings in the country, but it used to be the tallest building in the country. So, you know, my family was Italian, I'm Italian, and they came in through Ellis Island. They came in through New York City. New York City has always been a gateway 
And it's, you know, it's called the Big Apple. It's, it's a place where it's always been a symbol of America. Think about the Statue of Liberty and, uh, you know, you got the World Trade Center that all that happened there with the Freedom Tower now. And so uh, I think this is significant prophetically. And Jonathan actually did a really good video uh, about this. But uh, I couldn't just ignore this because when you, you know, it's a, it's a, think about it like this. Could you imagine if they put something Christian for a Christian movie? Any Christian movie. Let's just think about something that's come out in the last few years. Any any Christian movie, uh, War Room that came out, powerful movie, right? Have you seen that War Room? Imagine if they had uh, crosses all over New York. Now, at one time they did, and and people didn't seem to care about it. But now, anything that has anything to do with our faith, they you know all these organizations are up in arms and calling us hate mongers, and you know uh, they would never want to see a cross on. Uh, you know, imagine that it would be great. And it has happened in the past. Thank God when America was in a different place. But now instead of having a cross on the Empire State Building, they have a dragon. So see how things have shifted. And that's what I'm talking about. This Kairos moment, this moment in time where we're at right now, where I believe the spotlight is on the church. People from all around the world are looking at the American church and they're saying, what are you going to do? And we have tools in our toolbox, according to the word of God, of things that we can do as believers. And that's what we talk about on this show is we're not here to alarm you. We're here to arm you. And so the question I get asked the most as I go around the country is, Pastor Todd, what can we do? What what can we do? We see these egregious things. It grieves our heart. Sometimes we feel helpless. What can we do? Well, I'm going to answer that question a little bit more later on. But I just thought, wow, dragons all around New York City and then a sign that says you must choose now. I mean, how more blatant can they be? And by the way, you know, when the mark of the beast is rolled out, it's not like, you know, it'll be similar. They're not going to say, oh, here's the mark. The mark is here. That's not how the devil comes. He comes as an angel of light. You know, he doesn't show up at the door with a with a suit, you know, red suit and horns on. You know, he comes looking good or he comes in disguise. And so, yeah, it's a movie. It's a show, whatever. No big deal. No, it is a big deal because th that's what they're going to do when the mark comes out. They're going to have some elaborate campaign or some big corporation that's all excited about some new technology or something to get all these people all hyped up. They're not going to come out and say the mark of the beast is here. This is going to take discernment. It's going to take Christians. Now, I believe we're going to know if we're still here. And I, I'm hoping that we're out of here by then. But if we're still here, you know, I believe that those with ears to hear and eyes to see, we're going to understand. We're going to know. I don't think it's going to be a question for us. But the thing is, there's going to be many people and even people that claim to be Christians. You know, those ones that the Lord will say, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Those folks, those folks are going to make excuses. They're going to get it. They're going to get it and say, oh, it's no big deal. You're a conspiracy person. You know, all oh, you're, that's crazy. That's not, it's not the mark. Come on. Even though they're literally putting something on their right hand or their forehead. So, you know, that's how the devil works. He, he's not going to just come and, and say, here I am, you know, otherwise the people would know he comes as an angel of light. Oh, it's a television show. Oh, it's a movie. Oh, you know, you're a conspiracy theorist. Really? Because what I see is a dragon, which in revelation is literally what they call the devil. Okay. And he's, there he is on the, you know, wrapped around, the Empire State Building. I think it's significant prophetically. And so we need to continue to be watchmen on the wall and observe these types of things. I believe there's many signs. And the Bible says in the last days, there shall be signs, signs in the heaven, signs on the earth. And I believe we're seeing many of these signs and we report on it on this show. And those with ears to hear and eyes to see, you see it. All right, let's go on to the next segment here. Uh, we're going to talk about the tide that is turning. And this is a encouraging uh, segment and something that I'm happy to report on. And uh, let's go ahead and play this first clip and then we're going to talk about it. This video was brought to you by Nebula. Over the weekend, Europeans across the continent will go to the polls to vote in the EU Parliament elections. And the big story is the predicted electoral success of the so called far right. Polls ahead of the EU elections show that the far right parties are surging across Europe. And interestingly, young voters have emerged as a key demographic driving their success. In Germany, for instance, a recent survey found that 22% of Germans aged 14 to 29 backed the AFD, up from 12% in 2023. 
making them the most popular party in that age bracket. It's not just Germany either. Other polling suggests young people seem surprisingly keen on far-right parties in places like France, Portugal and the Netherlands, to name just a few. This has come as a bit of a shock to political commentators, given that young people are usually more left-wing than their older generations. Wow. Is the tide turning in Europe? You know, I just saw that uh, the, the Hungarian president is going to be taking over leadership of the EU. That's a huge because he's conservative. Uh, I think it's Viktor Orban. He's conservative, and I don't know if you ever heard him speak, but he's an amazing speaker and makes me want to go visit Hungary. I actually want to do a meeting out in Hungary, and we're going to be looking into that. Uh, but they're going to be taking over leadership of the EU. That's It's their time. And isn't it interesting that we're seeing in France – uh, a major move towards the right. Now they call it the far right, uh, but you know there's a, there's a shift that's happening politically, and I think a lot of this has to do with think about the Arab Spring. Do you remember that period of time, the Arab Spring, when you had uh, you know a bunch of uh, disruptions in the Middle East, which I think were probably caused by some. Uh, well, we won't get into that, or we'll get taken down. Uh, but remember when all of a sudden there was thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of refugees. That were, that were coming from the Middle East into Europe. And during that time period, Europe was changed forever. Uh, I remember Europe before that. It was a, it was a beautiful place and, uh, you know, very pristine. I, you know, we used to go to France, different places. And now when you go there, I'm not saying that it's still not nice, but a lot of the culture has changed because there has been a lot of people that have brought in, uh, you know, Muslim people and all different types of people that were brought in that have now changed the culture forever. And uh, a lot of these people have not assimilated with the culture of Europe, but instead have brought in their culture. And there's actually no go zones in European countries. Can you believe that? That's actually true. And there's a lot of stuff that you don't see being reported. That's why they had that massive yellow vest movement that was barely reported at all from the mainstream corporate media. And yet there was massive protests all around Europe, the yellow vest movement. You had the farmers, remember the farmers? Probably didn't see it on almost any regular mainstream news broadcast, but these guys were driving their tractors out, probably cost them a ton of money to get those tractors into the cities, you know, gas, they, their whole life has been disrupted by some of these policies, these radical environmentalist policies. And so these people's whole lives, these farmers and, 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 you know, they're, they're being told not to produce the meat and, you know, because it's the cows, uh, I don't even, you know, I can't say the words on here, but, you know, the, the, the cows uh, are polluting, polluting the air. And, uh, and so anyways, they're trying to stop the farmers, stop the cows, bring in this fake meat, this, this new kind of meat, which I think is probably not good for you. Uh, you got guys like Bill Gates that love this new type of meat that's not real. It's lab grown meat or it's not even real meat. Uh, they call them these beyond burgers and all this stuff. And, you know, they talk about eating bugs. They want, they want people to eat bugs. And, and so you know, these farmers were out there bringing their tractors in the streets and putting everything on the line. And yet, where was the journalism? Where were the people reporting? Now, the, the new media, you got the alternative media that was reporting it, but you didn't see reporting from the mainstream corporate media. And so this is the backlash, the continued backlash in Europe. And now it's reached. This is very pivotal and important. And this is why it's an opportune moment for us as believers, because these kids are ripe for Jesus. They're ripe for truth. There was a recent study from Barna, I believe, that came out and it said when they were asking the young people, what are you looking for in a church service? They weren't looking for the skinny jeans and the lattes or the smoke machines or the big screens, whatever with those things. I mean, I'm not saying they're horrible. You know, I've been in church that have them. You know, we use some of those types of things at our church. But the thing is, that's not what they're looking for. What they're looking for is sound doctrine. It's in sound doctrine and authenticity, sound doctrine and authenticity. And I believe that's what everybody's looking for at this point. They say, are you real? Are you, are you going to be speaking the truth from the word of God? Are you actually, do you believe what you're preaching preacher? Or are you trying to be a Christian celebrity? Are you in the business of Christianity or are you authentic? Because that's what the young people are looking for. So this is an opportune moment for the body of Christ, for the ecclesia, for those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, not only are they seeking more, you know, conservative policies, that's just a fruit of the fact that they're actually seeking the Lord. They're seeking God. They want the truth. They've been lied to. I think of my generation, 
You know, my generation was lied to. We had MTV and all this stuff that was telling us this is success. This is what success looks like. This is what you should do to be happy. And yet all these people have been miserable. I came from Hollywood. I saw a lot of these celebrities in my generation. I knew some of them personally. And I watched their lives and they had money and they had fame and they had all these things, but they were miserable. They had a huge void in their heart that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. And so I'm believing that this Kairos moment in time, that the Lord is using these ridiculous things like what we saw with Joe Biden and the debate, you know, all this stuff that we're reporting on, it's all leading into something. And this is, this is where we have to take this opportunity is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be authentic in our walk. You know, on this show, we try to be professional. I believe in excellence, but sometimes I just got to speak from my heart, guys. I mean, well, why, the reason why we do this every week, and there's a lot of work that goes into this show, you know, and today, uh, you know, it was kind of last minute, but Mario wasn't able to make it. And I'm just being real with you. But the thing is, is the reason why we do the show is because we, we believe in you. And we believe in the church. We believe that the church is the restraining force against the darkness. See, we don't want to just report on the darkness and all the evil things that are happening. We want to give solutions. We want to give actions. We believe that faith without works is dead according to the word of God. And so the fruit of somebody who's on fire for God is they're going to be a soul winner. The fruit of somebody that's on fire for God is there's going to be people around them. They're making disciples. They're raising up the younger generation. They're pouring in. Thank God for the folks like Mario and others, Pastor Jack Hayford, people that poured into me over the years. You know, I'm so thankful for elders and mentors. And that that's what made me be able to to understand what real Christianity is, you know, and, and to see the power of God moving under a tent or to see somebody get up out of a wheelchair or to see somebody be healed and set free and delivered, somebody to be healed from an opioid addiction or a drug addiction. And so I just, I've never understood it because I came from the world. And when I came into the church, uh, I remember I was so on fire and some people looked at me and they said, well, that won't last. And I said, my God, I hope it always lasts. I I don't ever want to not be on fire for God. And praise God, I'll tell you, I'm more on fire for God today than I've ever been before. But that's because I pressed ahead. And I know many of you understand this. You know, there's there's good seasons. There's bad seasons in Christ. You know, you have have mountaintop experiences. You have valley experiences. But the Bible talks about finishing well. We've got to finish well so that we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And, And so these young people, they need to hear about the gospel They need to hear the truth. They're looking for, according to the survey, authenticity and sound doctrine. My gosh, what an opportunity. And you see these young people in Europe. In Europe, I mean, this is a place that's usually more left-leaning than even America. And yet these young people are like, look, these policies are for the birds. This isn't working. You know, there's no moral compass. Something needs to change. They feel it inherently in their spirit, even though they don't even know. The Bible says the gifts come without repentance. He says, before I, I, uh, before you were born, I, I, you know, I knew you, you know, the Lord has, has literally made us fearfully and wonderfully. He made these young people fearfully and wonderfully. He put a blueprint on their heart of what's right and what's wrong. And so let's go ahead and play this second clip of another amazing development in Europe. A week of campaigning and deal making is beginning in France ahead of a second round of parliamentary elections next weekend. It comes after the far right National Rally Party emerged from Sunday's first round in a comfortable first place with just over 33 percent of the vote. President Macron, whose alliance trailed in third place on around 20 percent, has responded by calling for centrist and left wing parties to unite to prevent the far right from winning control of parliament. From Paris, here's Andrew Harding. A dramatic win yesterday for France's national rally. The party was for years considered too extreme for most French voters with its anti-immigration, Eurosceptic platform and its links to the Kremlin. But last night, the RN, as it's known here, secured more than a third of all votes. The party's leader is Marine Le Pen, who has her eye on winning the French presidency next. The Français ont ainsi, dans un vote sans ambiguïté, témoigné. She told the country it had nothing to fear from a right-wing RN-led government. Et de la Concorde nationale. But there is a second round of voting here next weekend, and things could still change. 
After yesterday's vote, President Emmanuel Macron called for centrist and left-wing parties to form a united front to keep the RN out of power. Will it work? It's going to be a struggle. So you see, even in France, uh, there's something shifting. The tide is seemingly turning. And I think what it is, I, I'm just going to share what I think is happening. I think they're trying to induce the tribulation before it's time. I think that the globalists and the whoever, whatever you want to call the people that are pulling the strings behind the scene, I think they're trying to induce the end time. Now, I believe we're in the end times, but I don't think it's the tribulation yet. I think we're in the birth pangs, and I think they're trying to induce this almost like we're later on than we are. You know, the Bible says there shall be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And one of the strategies of the enemy is to wear us down. How do I know this? Well, in my own life, he's tried to wear me down, and I know he's tried to wear many of you down. And a lot of times what he'll do is he'll hit us with what I call barrage. It's not just one thing. It's one, two, three, four, five things at once. And why he does that is because he wants us to grow weary. And the Bible says, do not grow weary in doing good. What are God's promises? They're yes and amen. What does he say? He's got plans for us for hope and a future. And so if he can get a good portion of Christians to feel defeated, to feel weary, to feel like we need to give up and that all we need to do is get in the ground under a bunker because we're in the tribulation, then there's not going to be those tending to this massive harvest. You see what I'm saying? So what we have to do as believers is we have to understand this. We have to discern this and say, look, even though I'm dealing with warfare, that means I'm over the target. That actually means I must be doing something right. Listen to me, Christian. Okay, I must be doing something right because the reason why I'm dealing with all this warfare to try to make me weary is so that I don't do what I'm called to do, so that I lose the vigor, so I lose the zeal. See, we need to have tenacity. We need to have stick to itiveness. That's why the Bible says we got to finish well. And so what's happening is because these policies are so bad and because there's no moral compass, and so people are getting depressed, you know, they're, they're trying what the world and the media and the movies and the streaming platforms and the celebrities are saying is success. They're trying these things in their own life and they're not seeing the results that they're being promised. Similar to how when I was in Hollywood, I didn't see the results. They told me, this is success. You know, if you have money, if you have a nice car, you know, if you're out there in the clubs and you're partying and you're doing all these things, oh, this is glamorous. This is success. I was miserable. It wasn't success at all for me. I, I, I had what the world said was successful. I was making good money and I was hanging out with, with you know, prominent people and yet I was miserable and they were miserable. And so I knew there had to be something more. Now, I'm just sharing my own testimony. But see, I'm believing that a lot of these young people, the European young people, the American young people, I think they're having the same type of experience. They're listening to what, you know, the propaganda and, and the, 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 you know, all these celebrities and influencers and people are saying, you need to do this. You need to do that. This is going to make you happy. And then they try it and they're not happy. Well, of course, they're not happy because the only thing that can fill the void is Jesus Christ, a personal relationship. He gives us that joy unspeakable. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? So that's that's the difference. You can't fake the joy of the Lord. You can't fake the feeling that is the, the fullness that the Holy Spirit gives you when he indwells in your heart. You can't fake that peace that passes understanding that can only come from God. And the world will try drugs and they'll try drinking and they'll try, you know, all these things, promiscuous lifestyles. Oh, this is going to make you happy. This is going to make you happy. It doesn't. It doesn't make you happy. And this is what I always tell Christians, and I believe that we got to understand, is we have the answer. We are on the winning team. We have the void filler. We have the answer in the Word of God. We have the answer in Jesus Christ. We have the answer in the Holy Spirit and dwelling in our heart. And, and so this is why this is all coming to a head, this Kairos moment where maybe God has allowed, I know I'm a little bit passionate right now, but maybe God has allowed all this to happen for such a time as this in this generation, okay, so that we can see a massive harvest before the Lord returns, so that we can preach and teach the truth and get people pulled out of darkness and in the light of Jesus Christ. 
I'm telling you, when we go around the country, friends, I've never seen more people in line to get prayer. I've never seen more people raising their hand, accepting Jesus. I'm talking people coming off of meth addictions, people coming off of opioid addictions, fentanyl addictions. They're coming. They're putting their drug sacks on the altar. I'm telling you, everywhere we go. I mean, at first it was almost kind of, I was like, what's going on? You know, because for many years it wasn't like this. And then all of a sudden it was like something shifted. And now it's like, we can go to Austin. We can go to California and Los Angeles. We can go to Texas. We can go to New York. It doesn't matter where we are. It's the same. The lines are so long. The folks are hungry. And so I think that the folks get it. I think that the leadership in the church is a little bit slow in understanding this moment, this Kairos moment that we're in. I believe that things are shifting. I don't think we're going to see uh, the celebrity culture that we've seen in the Christian community anymore. I don't think we're going to see pastors that are untouchable and uh, people. And I know I need to be a little careful here, but here's the deal. I serve an audience of one. Okay. And the deal is, is that I just don't think it's that season. I think this is a season for authenticity. I thought, I think this is a season for us to be real. I think this is a season for us to take the veneers off, you know, to unmask it, to, to actually deal with the problems at hand, to maybe actually start talking about these things and not, not look at the pastor. You're political. You're too political. It's not political. It's spiritual. Look at the state of our country. My goodness. What is it going to take? What is it going to take for people to wake up? I mean, you already have kids doing gender reassignment. I mean, how much more crazy? They're killing babies. How much more crazy could it get? And so I, I just think that, thank God, folks like you get it. And, and, and other folks are waking up. And I know there's still a lot of people with their heads buried, but more people than ever are awake. Folks are hungry. And we're seeing the tide turning in Europe. And we're seeing the tide turning here in America. And there are many things that are happening. I want to play this next clip because we're going to go to the next segment here. And I want you to see what just happened with the Supreme Court, another major data point that we got to look into. Let's go ahead and play this right now. Fox News alert, we're going to get out of that commercial break because we have word that the Supreme Court has issued a ruling on the extent of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during the tenure of President Trump. This is the big one we've been waiting for. It's consequential. It's really interesting that the Supreme Court in 248 years of our history has never actually ruled on this. So it is big and sweeping. And I have our political panel looking over this right now. Andy McCarthy uh, Chief Justice John Roberts has the writing on this. He's got the pen. Is that significant? It's very significant. Uh, it's the most important case of the term in terms of the long term interests of the executive branch, in terms of the long, uh, the short term interests of Ch Donald Trump. And it looks like at least within the bounds of clear executive authority, what Chief Justice Roberts is saying is that the president clearly has immunity from prosecution. Mm. So the question is going to be, again, I, and I, I think Trey underscored this before, is what is an official act? There's going to be a lot of litigation about that and what's close to the core of clear executive constitutional authority versus the outer ambit of mm -hmm. it. The winds just keep coming. They finally did it, gang. The Supreme Court has ruled that President Trump does indeed have wide-ranging presidential immunity. So that's that's one of the biggest decisions the Supreme Court is going to be making in this session and probably in a long time, honestly. Uh, the fact that they're now saying that presidents have a much broader immunity than uh, was described in the past or what people had thought and uh, it's just surprising that all these years that the Supreme Court has never actually colored in the lines on this. And so I think it's a very important decision. And this is one that is definitely in the favor of President Trump. You know, if you think about what's happening in America, I know people that are from the former Soviet Union are watching America right now. And they're thinking, my gosh, that's what we used to see when, when somebody would go after their political rival. I mean, that's what happens in a banana republic. That's what happens in, you know, communist countries. So I think that's why so many folks have been shocked to see this happening in America. Of course, the left, they want to go farther. Uh, they're, they're already saying things that are unheard of on social media, uh, you know, even talking about things I can't even talk about on this show that they want to do.
to President Trump because of this. And so, meanwhile, all they're really doing in the Supreme Court, I thought uh, Chris Ann Hall, actually, a friend of mine, she did a real good explanation on her X feed, uh, you know, where she says a lot of people aren't really describing what just happened correctly. And she really did a great explanation of what just happened from a constitutional standpoint. She's a constitutional lawyer. Uh, but really, this, this is absolutely in line with the Constitution. And uh, so I think this is going to help President Trump and it's going to help safeguard him from some of this egregious political attack that he's getting in the court system uh, in, in, in places where they the most places wouldn't even take these cases. But of course, New York, because it's a very left leaning blue city, uh, they were willing to take this case. And uh, other, other cities wouldn't even take it from a legal standpoint. And the other thing about it is there's a lot of holes in the case. So a lot of people say that, you know, when he appeals this, which he is doing, uh, the, the case in New York, that they're going to easily be able to appeal this because there's a lot of holes in the case from a legal standpoint, the way that they conducted this case. So uh, the, the problem is that a lot of people are saying, even though these things are true, what you're saying, Todd, is that how far will the left go? Will they try to put President Trump in, in jail? before the uh, convention, before the Republican convention? And that's a good question. I think it's probably going to be a no, and here's why. Last time when this whole uh, case came out and the verdict came in and that he was supposedly guilty on all these counts, uh, he raised more funding than I think ever before. I mean, it was like an overnight windfall that happened for his campaign. So I think the Democrats are probably concerned that if they put him in jail, uh, that he'll probably get another massive windfall of fundraising because folks are looking at this and they're saying this is crazy i mean uh, if you think about who's going to really determine this election and uh, for the most part it's going to be independents and independents these are not you know far leftists these are folks that maybe they didn't like his tweets in the past you know president trump's tweets maybe they bought some of the stuff that was going on in the in the media and some of the hype and the the stories that they would roll out every friday maybe they thought that he was collaborating with Russia. You know, maybe they bought some of these things. Well, a lot of, lots happened since then. And now these folks are going to the grocery store. They're spending almost double on their food bills. Gas prices are up. Cost of living is way up. Inflation is way up. Uh, they're looking at the mess that the world is in. You know, all of a sudden there's, there's all these unstable parts of the world. I mean, you got the South Pacific, uh, you know, in the South China Sea where there's saber rattling going on from China. They're looking at Taiwan. You have North Korea, once again, uh, saber rattling, and they're, they're making deals with Putin. You know, they're making, uh, you know, defense treaties with Putin and things to work with Putin now with their nukes. Um, you've got what's happening in Israel, in the Middle East, which is on fire. You've got what's happening in Eastern Europe, which is basically a quagmire. And we don't even really, most Americans don't even understand what the objective is over there. So these independent voters, they're looking at this whole thing and they're saying, you know what, Donald Trump, his America was much better than this America uh, under this current administration. So I think they got a real problem. As you look at African-American votes, 20% uh, of African-Americans are now talking about voting for Donald Trump. That's a staggering number. And it's a major increase from any past Republican candidate. So I think the Democrats are, are very concerned about these statistics and uh, the real polls, not the, not the suppression polls, but the real polls and uh, what you're seeing happening in Europe right now, uh, what you're seeing happening in the courts where the courts are defending the rule of law and they're saying, hey, these uh, these cases are not not really on the up and up. So we have to continue to pray for these matters. But another.
thì là mình đã xong hai lớp cạnh ở bên trong mình sẽ dùng phần đuôi của phần bụt chi cũng cầm nhẹ cạnh hoa tạo hoa có độ cầm ở báo tam điểm của một phần hoa đây chúng ta sẽ ẩn nhẹ ở phần tam điểm của một cạnh hoa xong hai phần cạnh hoa bây giờ tiếp theo với hai cạnh hoa còn lại mình cũng sẽ tiến hành cắt phần cạnh hoa này sau hơn một chút là phần tâm để tiến hành tạo đồ công tiếp cắt tâm tầm khoảng không phải năm cm 